Marshall Juana, wonderful to see you on G Zero World. A pleasure. So as we kick off the Munich Security Conference, um, on the one hand, I am hearing publicly a lot of people that are very committed to doing whatever it takes for Ukraine. And privately, I'm hearing people ask me a lot of questions about how do we ever get out of this? Are there any off ramps? How does the war end? How do you square those two things? I have to say that politically, we just had the defense ministers of NATO meeting in, uh, in uh, Brussels. Politically and practically, I see tremendous unity. I mean, there is a real, real, real commitment to help Ukraine uh, for the long haul. But we know that eventually all wars uh, end around the negotiation table. We also know that very much will depend on the situation on the battleground. And for the time being, speaking of potential off-ramps, uh, we see the two sides, uh, President Putin on the other side, President Zelensky on the other side, being so far apart in terms of what they would imagine as an acceptable solution that we see uh, and we believe that this war will continue. And I think we are there to help them all the way because helping them is also uh, helping us. Now, it's been almost a year. It feels like we're just seeing at this point further escalation further escalation from the Russians in terms of the new offensive that we seem to be seeing on the ground right now with a lot more troops. Also further escalation from NATO in terms of what they're willing to provide to the Ukrainians on the ground. Is that accurate and do you think that's likely to continue over the coming months? I would not call this escalation. I would call it dynamic adjustment to a changing situation on the battlefield. So let me be very, very clear. Yeah. The fundamental job of NATO is to defend allies. Territory, population, soon to be 32 allies, okay? That's our number one job. The other thing that we do uh, in NATO and also ally nations individually and partners of NATO individually is helping Ukraine in a dynamic way. There's no escalation. There is a changing nature of the battlefield. And it's normal in a way that this kind of support we give them reflects the reality on the ground. Helping them means also to help them with the things they need according to this stage and future stages of the war, but also avoiding the risk of escalation between Russia and NATO. And that's something that we do. It's sometimes a fine line that's sometimes complex in terms of political and strategic things, but we do that simultaneously, defending allies, helping Ukraine and avoiding escalation. I come back to the idea of escalation. There is no intention from our side to escalate this uh, into a war between NATO and Russia. And secondly, we see no capacity from Russia to, in, to, to, to escalate in a conventional way with us. Mm -hmm. We see not the intent and no other capabilities. Uh, of course, we see the nuclear saber rattling around nuclear and, and, and the communication around that, which is, which is uh, dangerous in itself. But we don't see a real risk of Russia having the intent or the capacity they, they barely, they barely resist in Ukraine. How can they think that they can engage with a much more potent alliance, which is NATO? Obviously, the Russian military proved itself to be vastly less capable than a lot of people in the West believed. One year into this war, what are the principal lessons that NATO has taken away from Russia's fighting capacity? And what do you think that means going forward? It's clear that we have seen uh, on the one side a remarkable capacity of the Ukrainian people and military and leadership to basically uh, just move to a heroic uh, resistance and, and, and capacity to, to mobilize the energy of the nation. I would say we're not that surprised on the Ukrainian side because we've been training Ukrainians since 2014, since the illegal invasion of Crimea. And Ukrainians are also very good, other than being very brave, because they have adopted already NATO standards, command and control. You see this kind of agility at the local command. On the Russian side, uh, we don't see uh, much of lessons learned in terms of the weakness of the post-Soviet era doctrine and also a very, very uh, stiff and rigid uh, vertical of command and control. But we also see, and this is why we say, don't underestimate Russia. As overestimating Russia was a mistake, underestimating Russia could also be a mistake. They're still a big country. They can mobilize people. Uh, they, uh, they have, let's say, a le relative immunity to uh, loss of lives uh, because of the regime they, they have. 
So we are, we are really now uh, bracing for uh, uh, a very significant and violent uh, new phase of the war with the offensive uh, starting and with the Ukrainians preparing their own counteroffensive, which is something that, uh, that they do. Now, you mentioned that the Ukrainians are now uh, fighting and training at NATO level standards. The Ukrainians are being invited into the European Union. No one was going to do that before the war. There wasn't a process to bring Ukraine into NATO before the war. It was basically a stalled process. Do you now see that changing? So nations, allies, and partners are doing the lethal aid. Uh, NATO is doing the non-lethal aid. We continue to help them with interoperability, with education on anti-drone and things like that. The process of enlargement of NATO, historically, in the last 30 years, has been a policy of open door. And of course, Ukrainians um, and President Zelensky and some of the allies argue that we should engage with Ukraine on an accelerated path towards membership. I have to say that today there is no consensus on, on this one. So I think what we should do is to help uh, Ukraine win the war and then we'll look into the broader security arrangements that we'll need. We applaud the fact that the EU is moving forward with Ukraine. That's a very good thing because it's also part of anchoring them in the uh, European and transatlantic families of nation. And it's, it's, it's up to, to Ukraine, it's up to us to decide when and if uh, NATO membership would, ev would be eventually granted. For the time being, uh, the number one focus for us is to help them win the war. And we applaud the fact that the EU is giving them uh, a European perspective, which is helping them uh, you know, anchor themselves to the West. Last question for you, and this is one that we've been talking about for a long time at Munich, which is NATO members are not all committing the levels of expenditure that they need to, that they've promised to. There's been recently a stepped-up effort to try to convince everyone a minimum of 2% GDP spend on military expenditure if they want to be NATO members in good standing. Um, but they're under massive economic pressure, given the war, given the pandemic, given inflation levels, given the recession. Do you feel like this process is moving in the direction you need to see it? We are insisting uh, because we know that there are economic difficulties. We know there's always a, a difficult trade-off for political leaders between social, economic investments and defense-related investments. But the reality is that we are living in a very dangerous world. We just cannot afford not to be stronger also in terms of security and defense. So our aim, and uh, we are optimistic that in, in Vilnius we'll be having the 2% uh, basically uh, as the floor and not the ceiling, and we see more and more allies uh, getting towards that thing. Let me give you a number for the American public. Since 2014, European allies and Canada have added to our defense budgets 350 billion additional US dollars. 350. Turning point, yeah. There's a turning point. It's a beginning of a strategic awakening in Europe. And if some allies, mainly from Western Europe, have been, you know, hesitant about how much to spend on defense and how much on other things, now this brutal awakening of all of us is making the alliance understand, and our public opinion, I hope, to understand that this is uh, money that is well spent uh, because our defense, our security uh, cannot be taken for granted anymore. Now, Mr. Joana, thank you very much. Sir. Thank you so much.